Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again, folks, to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. we got a full house today. And one, one of the entities we're going to bring back, we brought back to kind of give us a, a far better detail about what's going on. And I'm, I'm talking in regards to the sweet cakes issue. You know, that, that $135,000 these people are sort of like sitting with and, uh, and trying to figure out what, what they're going to do. And so I brought Herb Gray back with us, and uh, he's going he's gonna to give us maybe dot some I's and cross some T's. And also brought another associate with him who's going to kind of fill us in on some other little issues and whatever. And, uh, and as time goes on, we're going to hopefully have the, the, the small business person that's been affected. They're under a gag order right now, so they can't do anything. So we're just going to go on and kind of give you a little bit more detail and background on that piece. So, Herb, welcome. Welcome. Okay, and then we've, got, we've got Anna now. We've got a new person with Anna Harmon. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. It's kind of nice seeing your face as opposed to this guy. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for being with us. You're okay? welcome. I always like to get a little niche in As you notice, I wear my, my cap here, the, the Vietnam vet aspect of it. And I always make it a point that um, uh, to vets out there that uh, they should get out there and get their benefits. It's very important. A lot of these guys, are, they've been through a lot of issues, and I've been there too. I've uh, been in Nam um, and whatever, and a lot of them just don't want to talk about it. But many of them are having some real major problems, PTSD and, and a lot of other issues and whatever. And so we're trying. So my thing is to try to get them, i.e., to the VA and get their get their benefits, if you will, they need. So guys, get out there, loved ones. Like I said before, put them in the car and take them down to the VA, whether it be up in the hill or whether it be at Vancouver. Okay. All right. So with that, now let's go on and get into the show here. Okay. Fine. Herb. Uh, why don't you just sort of brief the, brief the viewing audience you know, a little bit about what we did and bring it up to this particular point and how right. and, and, and uh, how, how, how Anna can get in. Well, Bruce, you and I had a conversation right. a couple of weeks ago where we kind of looked at the case from 30,000 feet. Right. And um, so we, we kind of talked about the fact it started back in January of 2013, and mm -hmm. it was a long process. Uh, it's something that's being handled by the Bureau of Labor and Industries rather than a regular court. Um, and we can get into that a little bit more today, um, talking about just how it was really a very uh, politically driven process in many respects, and kind of brought it up to the to the current day where the uh, the, the clients um, who are, had to shut down their business basically in September of 2013 because of all of this um, are now facing a $135,000 damages award from the Bureau of Labor and Industries. And they're also subject to a gag order that prohibits them, but doesn't prohibit anybody else from really talking about the case. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you and I talked about mm -hmm. is the details behind all those right. things would be really important for us to cover today for the mm -hmm. for the audience. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, just for, for the uh, just just from a layman's standpoint, and was all the issues of that refusing, if you will, refusing to sell cake or make a cake, if you will, for a small business person. Right. I'm going to let Anna talk to that. Oh, okay. okay, good. That's good. That's good. Okay, good. So, Anna, let, get, give us the deal. Yeah. First off, what's your background? Where, where are you going? My, I, I've been an attorney at Tyler Smith & Associates for the last few years, and okay. I work on a lot of different issues. We do a general practice firm, so we oh. do a lot of business issues. And uh, on the side for fun, we do constitutional stuff every once in a while. Oh, great. Sounds good. Tell Tyler <laughs> I said hi. <laughs> okay, uh, so the background of this case is uh, what happened is back in 2013, uh, a woman came in to Aaron and Melissa Klein's bakery, where Melissa has worked for, I think, between seven to ten years making mm. these elaborate wedding cakes. Mm. And I'm sure you've seen and many yes. of your viewers have seen now, wedding cakes are not just eggs and flour and sugar mixed together and thrown in the oven. Mm -hmm. They've kind of turned into their own, a life of their own. Wedding cakes are a big part of weddings. So Melissa has explained before on in many different avenues that she really puts her heart and soul into what she does. She, she actually designs out, she sketches out um, a drawing of the cake until it's what the client really wants. Mm -hmm. So she sketches out different versions and until the client says, yeah, that's the cake I want. And then she turns that into a form of kind of edible artwork. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. back in 2013, um, a woman came in to her shop and asked for a cake for her wedding. And Aaron Klein, uh, Melissa's husband, said, okay, that sounds great. Can I get the groom's name? And it was at that point that the woman informed him there was no groom, it was two brides. And um, it was a very calm, quick conversation. It ended pretty much as soon as it began. Mm -hmm. And Aaron just said, I'm sorry, B 
because of our religious beliefs, Mm -hmm. we don't do wedding cakes for same-sex weddings. Mm -hmm. An important thing to remember is that Aaron didn't say we don't serve same-sex couples. He said we don't participate in same-sex weddings because, Mm -hmm. in fact... They had served this exact same couple before for a different event. Same so, couple. Same okay, couple. Wow. Exactly they the same the couple. The, the yeah, for the, for a different event. Yeah. So it had nothing to do with the people mm-hmm. themselves. It had everything to do with the event that was going to be celebrated. Mm-hmm. And Aaron and Melissa are devoted Christians. I'm sure your view, your viewers have seen that in the mm-hmm. news and mm-hmm. different stories. And they believe that their work is not just... You know, or their worship isn't just something they do at church on Sundays. Mm-hmm. When they go into their business, it's part of what they do. Mm-hmm. And so they didn't feel like they could put their heart and soul into a cake for an event which their religion taught was wrong. Mm-hmm. So that's how this really started. And which at the right. time was actually illegal under Oregon law because the uh, Oregon Constitution prohibited same-sex marriage at the time. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's an important, it's an interesting thing to note that if the couple who requested the cake from Aaron and Melissa had walked into um, any county office in the state of Oregon and asked for a marriage license, Mm -hmm. the county would have said, no, we don't do same-sex weddings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the state of Oregon basically is beating on the Kleins for something the state of Oregon at that time wouldn't be willing to do itself. Well, they, they, normally, if, if there's that, this kind of decision, normally you'd go to a normal court situation. You get you know, the hearing and all this, that, and the other. Why isn't it being handled in court? Is it, from what I hear, you, it's not? Well, what happened is um, these two girls filed complaints with the Bureau of Labor and Industry, which okay. is one of the options in the statute. Mm-hmm. And um, what happens is if, if you get into a BOLI process, um, <clears throat> BOLI wrote the regulations that the process is governed by. Okay. And uh, a Boley investigator investigates the complaint, and Boley personnel decide whether there's any merit to the complaint. And then Boley prosecutors, that's actually their title, actually um, file formal charges and conduct a hearing. Mm -hmm. And the hearing is conducted before an administrative law judge who is not a lawyer who works for Boley. And so everybody so far works for Boley. And then ultimately, once there's a proposed final order that comes from the administrative law judge, what happens is it's handed to the commissioner of labor and industries, who uh, during this whole time has been Brad Avakian, Mm -hmm. and he issues what's called a final order. So if you look at the whole, the the way that everything's done, it's not being done in a court Mm -hmm. where the Bill of Rights applies and Mm -hmm. you have all these sort of procedural guarantees and an impartial decision maker. Mm -hmm. Everybody involved in the process works for the guy who's making the final decision. Mm -hmm. And they all know what the result is that he wants. Mm. And most people, if you think about it, when you go to work, do you do things that you know your boss isn't going to be happy with? Mm -hmm. No, you're Mm -hmm. going to try and do what you what you feel you need to do to follow the directions that you have. And so when you look at this whole process, it's it's just like if somebody had a dispute with the IRS, Mm then what would happen is you would end up dealing with IRS people and ultimately you would be dealing with an IRS administrative law judge and then it would go to a tax court, which is former IRS people and tax lawyers. So most people would say, if I'm in a fight with the IRS, is it a fair fight if the IRS is making the decision when there's IRS people at council table on the other side? That's exactly the same process Mm. that we have now. So we have an executive agency of the state of Oregon, which is basically doing legislative stuff, mm-hmm. they're doing uh, judicial stuff, mm-hmm. and they're an executive agency. What happened to separation of powers? Mm-hmm. I mean, which is required by the Oregon Constitution mm-hmm. as well as the U.S. Constitution. But Boley is doing all of that. So that's the process. Mm-hmm. In over two and a half years, this this case has been winding its way through this bureaucratic process where everybody on the other side works for one agency. Mm. And let me ask you a question about, what about, are there, bo- there are bowlers are all around the country. Is there a similar kind of a case running around or something like that? Sure. No, there are Bowley is particularized to Oregon, but administrative law happens both in our federal government and in really every state around right. the country, as far as I know. So um, 
different, there are a lot of different cases like this around the country, and I'm sure your viewers have heard of things like Arlene's Flowers um, or, um, or uh, Masterpiece Bakery in Colorado oh, really? or okay. Hands On Originals in Kentucky. Okay. And there's a number of more that I haven't mentioned, but these are happening all over the country. And most, if not all of them, I believe, have been held in administrative courts. I don't believe any of them have started in an actual circuit court. Really? And to, to clarify, to bring the... Um, you know, the jargon of administrative law into mm -hmm. something your listeners can understand. Okay. There's no jury in an administrative court. You don't have an opportunity for a jury. And the normal things that you think of when you think of court aren't really in place. So um, you're right. Yes, they're, it's happening all around the country. And they're really all starting in these kind of sub-courts mm -hmm. that don't have the due process guarantees that the Constitution gives mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So, again, on that same note, then, and just getting right down to it, because I want you guys to speak as much as you can. This is quite an assessment, $135,000 for this kind of an issue. I mean, I, I, just from a layman standpoint, aspect of it. So, what do you think about the clients? Should the clients win this deal? Are they going to win this deal and, and not pay this? They've already been assessed, right, by Bureau of Labor, right, on $35,000? That's correct. But as we've said before, it hasn't yet been in front of what we would consider yeah, a real yeah, court, yeah, a constitutional yeah. court. And we do think that once we get in front of the Court of Appeals, okay. in front of a judge that's willing to apply the Constitution, the fundamental foundational constitutional principles, American constitutional principles, will win the day. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important principles is the freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And as I talked about earlier, when you make when you make a cake, it's not just mixing up flour mm -hmm. and oil and eggs. Uh, it becomes artwork. It really does. When you see these cakes, they're they're sculptures, really. Mm -hmm. They're a lot of them times they're painted. Melissa draws it out by hand, and then she carves it and molds it by hand. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it becomes artwork. It becomes expressive. And the First Amendment to the Constitution protects expression, just like it protects paintings and just like it protects sculptures. The government could never force a person to paint a picture mm -hmm. for you or sculpt mm -hmm. some clay or rock or you know something for a person that those are those are artistic expressive activities and what Melissa's doing is no less expressive mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court of the United States has upheld that yeah. you can require a um, business to uh, you know accommodate everyone but you can't make speech the accommodation does that make sense mm -hmm. Let's a little bit more. You got you got another little. Well, the what uh, what Anne is referring to is these statutes uh, that we're talking about cover housing, employment, and what's called public accommodation. And basically, you're a place of public accommodation if uh, you invite the public to come in. So, government offices, for example, are a place of public accommodation. And and so the idea is nobody really challenges the idea that if someone comes into a public place mm -hmm. whether it's a business or a government office or whatever they ought to be treated you know equally and fairly the issue becomes if someone comes in and says i want you to do this particular thing for me um, and it's something that is based on um, that, that may violate certain sincerely held beliefs mm -hmm. and so um, in effect, what happens in this kind of a context, if somebody comes in and says, you have to make me a cake, mm -hmm. if that cake is speech and the government says you have to do it, the government is requiring people to engage in speech that they may disagree with. Um, and that's a lot different from the situation which the Kleins had been in and a lot of these other cases that Anna referenced. Um, all those people had uh, businesses where they had a long history of serving gay people for a variety of things. So it was never about discriminating against gays. Mm -hmm. Still isn't. Mm -hmm. What it's about is I don't feel comfortable being part of that particular event. So to put that in context, the Hands On Originals t-shirt case in Kentucky, for example, Gay Pride Festival comes in and says, we want you to do our shirts for our Gay Pride Festival. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's something where that particular um, Blaine Adamson had done business with these folks before and he'd done business for a lot of other uh, gay folks for a variety of other things but he says you know I don't feel comfortable doing this one I'll help you find somebody and he actually did mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't good enough because they wanted to force him to do it against his conscience and that's where we get into a situation what lawyers call compelled speech mm -hmm. where the government is saying okay we have a message and you're gonna say it whether you like it or not, whether it violates your conscience or not. 
So when Anna alludes to the First Amendment, what we're saying is people have the right to exercise their First Amendment rights. And what Boley is saying here is, well, all those rights go away if it's a message that we want you to participate in. Hmm. And everybody has to be on board with same-sex marriage. Therefore, you're going to do it. Wow. wow. And, and we can all agree that a government that tells you what you can't say is bad enough, but a government that tells you what you have to, to say, say and then punishes you if you don't say it is really scary. And that's what mm -hmm. we have happening here. Well, and the other component of speech here is we made reference to the gag order, right. which basically says the clients are not in a position to mm -hmm. say that they're going to refuse to serve. Well, they never said that mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Never said. But what, what happened is that that particular ruling by the commissioner, uh, Brad Avakian, was based on prior statements they'd made that they are going to stand firm. Hmm. In their faith. Yeah. So they're just saying, we're not going to back down. We disagree with what's happening. And so, in effect, what has now happened is, in addition to all these other speech violations, now Brad Avakian is telling these folks, now you can't tell people that you're going to stand, you're going to continue to to fight this thing, and to stand up for your rights, which most people I think am, it would find terribly unfair, especially if the commissioner himself continues to talk about it publicly, which he has, mm -hmm. and the other parties involved continue to talk about it publicly, which they have. So in effect, we have a situation now where everybody who's not on board with the government's message is being told they can't talk, and everybody else continues to talk. Well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting point, and especially, I can remember reading about the issue, and it was, it was kind of like they weren't going to do this, I mean, from the media standpoint. Mm. I mean, it wasn't that was the clarification. That's why, you, that's why we're here yeah. today, kind of educating the public about what mm. really went on. Sure. And then now it's sort of like there's, a, there's another layer that comes on now because after the Supreme Court just went this, through this ruling, if you will, of the same-sex marriage thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, now, you know, so what, what, what difficulties have you, you see anything, do you see an impact on that at all, on this particular case at all? Well, I, I mean, think it's important to, to realize that um, this case, you know, was brought in Oregon before marriage, what right. happened before marriage was legal exactly. in Oregon. At that time, like Herb, Herb said, the government it was, it was telling Aaron and Melissa they had to do something that government itself, itself wasn't willing to do. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, it kind of, this case sort of has transcended the issue of marriage because it wasn't, it's from the beginning hasn't been about the, the people. It's been about the event. It's been about the particular right. event. Well, and the other thing I would say is most people assume, well, now everybody has to do it since the Supreme Court ruled. But the reality is the, uh, there was a, a recent AP poll Mm -hmm. where the Associated Press asked um, several thousand people about their opinions about, um, about same-sex marriage mm -hmm. and compared it to prior polls they'd done. Mm -hmm. And actually, since the time the Supreme Court uh, imposed same-sex marriage on the entire country, support for same-sex marriage has declined by north of five point percentage points in 30 days. Mm -hmm. And it was starting to decline before the Supreme Court ruled. So we now have a situation where the government is cramming this down on, a, on the citizens of the United States, fewer and fewer of whom actually support the position that the government is advocating, hmm. which makes these types of cases even more egregious because there are a lot of people who happen to agree with our clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I know one thing as a result of that, um, I know that, that suppose that there was a, we were getting ready to have the presidential debates, if you will, and it was mentioned today, if you will, on Fox and CNN, that there were five major points that the, that the public was very concerned, and one of which was the whole issue of, uh, of LBGT, the, the whole issue of right. same-sex marriage and things of that nature. So, so now it's, on, it's back on the table aspect of it. But again, what about the clients, you know, for these four folks, what are they doing now? How are they, how are they responding to this issue? Sure, they're responding like they've always responded. Yeah. They've been consistent throughout this okay. entire case that okay. their faith is important to them. It's mm -hmm. in, it's absolutely the bedrock of how they live their lives. Mm -hmm. And so whether they're told whether the government is going to force them to say something or they're not 
they're not going to do it because their faith is more important to them than what the government is telling them they have to say, which is what this whole case is about. So how are they doing? They're doing as well as you would expect someone to do that has five children yeah. and, uh, you know, the, the smallest two of whom are twin boys who are two or three now. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they've, they have their struggles. They, you know, they've been burned down with this case for more than two and a half years for no good reason other than that the government wants to get people on board with the message it's trying mm -hmm. to uh, communicate. So they're, you know, they're um, making, trying to make ends meet and they have, now they're facing a judgment of $135,000, which the, according to the decision, has started accumulating interest at the statutory rate from the day the final order was issued. So um, this is a, you know, this is a real family. We're not mm -hmm. talking about uh, a business that the fine has been, or the damages award has been levied against a business that can just, the mm -hmm. business can declare bankruptcy and it goes away. This is a personal award against Aaron and Melissa as individual people. You know, Aaron and Melissa as the parents of five children, not as their business. So All it's right. a, this is, it's. Well, and I think a lot of, I mean, we filed a notice of appeal mm -hmm. so that we're going to get this in front of the Oregon Court of Appeals um, and people who wear black robes and have actually mm -hmm. graduated from law school and passed the mm -hmm. bar. But I, I think it's also uh, important to remember that I think many people are now starting to realize the impact on people for really simple conversations mm -hmm. like what Anna described. Mm -hmm. um, every business is potentially in the gun sites now mm -hmm. of being compelled to do something um, that they may not choose to do. Mm -hmm. And reasonable minds can differ about whether those are good ideas or bad mm -hmm. ideas, but I think many people who own businesses or work in small businesses are starting to realize that their real adversary now is becoming their state and federal government. Mm -hmm. And that's not a fair fight. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you make a good point there because and that's another reason why we're doing this is that uh, in Portland is pretty well recognized here in the state of Oregon. In Portland, Oregon, they're very, very pro-gay in this kind of an environment. It's a very pro-gay kind of an environment aspect of it. And, um, it, you know, and we need to, again, that's the reason why we need to have this in court. We also need this third party so that we, this can go through and, and, be, and, be, and be talked about and hopefully find out what the real issues are. I think it's an important point that I want to continue to stress that whether Portland's pro-gay or not, we can all be pro-freedom. Yeah, yeah, pro-gay yeah, yeah, or yeah, any yeah. other way, yeah. that's not what Aaron and Melissa have right, demonstrated. Right, right. What they've demonstrated is that the, we can all agree as Americans, as Oregonians, right. no matter where we stand right. on any issue, right. that the constitutional freedom to speak or not to speak mm -hmm. is really important and is paramount to no matter what your position is, mm -hmm. you need to be able to free, mm -hmm. you need to be free mm -hmm. to live out your faith in the way that you live and work. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I think we've seen to your earlier point um, that people all around the country have supported Aaron and Melissa, have come, you know, rallied around them in, in these cases around the country. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that people around the country are saying, this is something that's really important. And, mm -hmm. you know, your viewers have probably seen there's been a lot of money raised for that. Well, that, you know, we don't know yet how that how long this case is going to last, what's going to have to be done with all of that. But we what we do know is that Americans right now are concerned, yeah. not necessarily yeah. about pro-gay yeah. or not right, pro-gay, right, but right. about pro-freedom. Right. Right. Uh, right, 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 right. Well, I, I make it again, make that point. They need that day in court. Well, they and, really need that day in court. and I think it's also important for everybody to understand that um, part of the personal cost of this mm -hmm. for Aaron and Melissa yes. Klein has been death threats what? against them, against their children. I mean, there's been an orchestrated um, uh, campaign against them for two and a half years. Hmm. And what Anna just referred to is a not very orchestrated bubbling up from grassroots mm -hmm. from people across the country, regular folks who say, it is not okay for people to be vilified for just trying to live and work according to their sincerely held beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. Well, tell and, me, there's the same point. Think about this. Would this, would this have happened uh, in Southern Oregon? If they had, had a, if they'd had a little shop up in Southern Oregon, let's say, in, let's say Ben or something like that aspect of it, do you think we would have had the same situation? Well, I'm gonna just a thought. Just a thought. I'm a Southern Oregon boy originally. Yeah, go on, go on. Okay, but I would say the chances are increasingly that this kind of thing will happen, 
And a lot of people tend to think that in Oregon, you know, we, we sort of have a liberal component clustered around Portland and yeah. then everybody yeah. else is different. Yeah. But there are pockets of people all over. Okay. And, you know, there have been problems like this that have arisen in upstate New York, which isn't really a bastion of liberalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, these kinds of problems have popped up in Kentucky, which most people don't think of mm -hmm. as a real, you know, a liberal type of place. Um, and even uh, east of the mountains, you know, the Arlene's Flores case is in the Tri-Cities, east okay. of the mountains. You wouldn't expect that there would be a problem there, and yet there is. Okay. So I think it's safe to say that what's happening, and particularly since the state of Oregon is putting its, put it, it's putting its mm -hmm. uh, finger on the scales, mm -hmm. and now the U.S. government is doing the same, it doesn't matter where you are, mm. because the government's going to come after you. Okay, okay. So they in court in, in Portland, Oregon, no problem? You just, just basically you want the, the opportunity to let them have that day in court. Fair? Well, I think the American people want I know. them, I, yeah. I hear you. you know yes, that's right. But it is an issue. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's just freshly yeah. done in regards to the Supreme Court's decision about the gay marriage thing. Well, and one of the things that's surprising as we talk to people is most mm -hmm. people don't understand that all of this has happened in an agency. Okay. That it's Good. being done in Boley yes. rather than court. Yes. So they assume that all the things that they expect would happen in a court have been happening. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, well, no, bully investigators, mm -hmm. bully prosecutors, mm -hmm. bully administrative law judge, who's not even a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, everybody works for the same guy. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think when most people find out about that, they go, well, that's not OK. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a process thing, completely aside from what people understand mm -hmm. about the result and whether they accept the result. Mm -hmm. And I think. As people kind of process that, what, they, what they're starting to think more and more, that we've got the government setting the rules of engagement, and it means you have to deal with the government, and it means that you're dealing with people, you know, one person may be elected, but all the people who are making this happen are not elected, mm -hmm. and it's happening out of the public view most mm -hmm. of the time. So, so the idea here now is that, okay, it's in Boley's hand. That's the government aspect of it. You've got a small business person over here aspect of it. So now is it going to go to another government court or is it just going to go to a, just a public court? Good, good question. question. Yeah. So the way that the legis the Oregon legislature has set this process up is it starts in Boley, and it's not it's going to completely skip what we call the circuit court okay. phase. So that's where you would normally have a jury trial and do your you know put your evidence on before a judge. We're right. skipping that and we're going we, because we have to and we're going to the court of appeals. So the court of appeals will review the case, but they don't rehear the case. So we won't put on additional evidence. We won't have any more testimony from. Aaron or Melissa or any other mm -hmm. witnesses mm -hmm. will just have the court will just review the decision that Bully made. So the legislature has allowed uh, Bully to completely skip the normal circuit court process where there's all the procedural guarantees like of the due other process. Side, like the other side of the clients. Will they, will, they be, will they look at that also too as far as the clients, their position? Uh, well, the other side of the clients is the state of Oregon. Is that what you mean? The, no, no. I'm just, with the client's portion, their, their response to the, this whole issue. Sure, yes. They'll, they'll review a, the decision. Okay. The Court of Appeals okay. will review Bully's okay. decision for for um, problems, due process problems, right. um, constitutional problems, basic evidence problems, okay. all the things we're going to Okay, so, so if they're given the opportunity to get in court, what court will they be in? The Oregon Court of Appeals. Oregon Court of Appeals. Right. Okay. So we've already argued a lot of things, like the client's didn't discriminate against these people and they served them before, which the Boley administrative law judge says, well, that doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. Well, if you're saying we don't discriminate against people, the fact that you've served them before does matter. Mm. And there's all kinds of issues like that, which are in the record that eventually, you know, the Court of Appeals will now see, mm -hmm. which have been rejected by Boley and we think have legal significance, mm -hmm. but we've never gotten the chance to actually put on a, a court hearing in front of an impartial decision maker who can actually say, mm -hmm. let's look at this and come up with the, the right answer. Well, you know, Herb, that's one of the reasons why I got in touch with you. The fact of the matter is that I'm a small business person, too, and the clients are a small business person, but we, we haven't heard the, I haven't heard the client side of the deal. But now that here's this gag order. You know, I, I'd yeah. really love to see if, why can't they come here and express themselves as small business persons, you know what I mean? Is that possible? That's going to be possible. Can we get them on at some later date before this other situation? Or do you have to wait until you get a ruling that says, okay, we'll go to court? What's the deal as far as Boulder's concerned? 
Well, Bully is, we're not sure exactly what the gag order means, and that's part of yeah. the problem. So yeah. all we can do is look back at what Bully has said has violated the law in the past. And okay. Brad Avakian has said that just their statement that they're going to stand firm is a violation. So, yes, they can still you know, talk to the media, but whether what they say is going to get them in trouble, we're just not sure. Well, not the media, but the people. You know, the, just a small business. There's a lot of small businesses out there. We're being faced with all kinds of things. You know, the, the hourly wage thing. I mean, the, 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 the sick leave thing. There's a lot of things. And we, we're sure. struggling. A lot of small businesses are struggling. And, you know, the the, the, the small businesses are really the base of, of our productivity from the, from, you know, from the standpoint right. of jobs and this, that, and the other. So this is a very important point, and that's why I'm trying to press this point. And hopefully, Bowling might, can they change their mind? or if, Can they give you guys a call tomorrow and say, okay, fine, uh, we want to go We're on. not holding our breath for that. <laughs> oh, okay. They What's can. interesting, Bruce, is I can call, right? as soon as this final order came out with the gag order, yeah. a lot of people, including ACLU lawyers and a bunch of other folks, said, this is not okay. Wow. So there was a, a response to it, and actually Bowley put out a press release saying this is not mm -hmm. a gag order, yeah, right. even though everybody understood that it was. And we, do, as Anna said, we don't know what's really going to violate that order because it right. doesn't say. And the clients are going to continue to say what they want, th right. what they have to say, right. Right. whether it gets them in trouble or not remains to be seen. Wow. Well, I tell you what, I, I'm, I appreciate you all coming over. I mean, again, like I said, I'm speaking for the small businesses, too. I've talked to a lot of the small business folks. They don't, they're sort of like on pins and say, hey, Bruce, what if they walk in my shop? Right. You know, and what, what am I going to do? And then plus the fact, i got to come up with the money to get myself represented. I mean, it, it, they're on pins and needles. A lot of small business. Sure. Heart folks, all, all kinds of folks. And for a good reason, they're yes, on pins and needles. So. Well, look, we're going to sort of wait for you, and hopefully you guys can get back to us, and, and I will give Bowley a call. You know, I'll, I'll talk to the guy and say, hey, look, we'll take this thing off. I'll give these people an opportunity to go in court, but I'd like to see if I can get them this. And we hope your yeah. viewers do, too. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> or we'll ask Brad Avakian to come on the show well, and do. defend his decision. No, that's what I'll do. I know Brad. Right, Brad? <laughs> okay, good. We're going to take a short break, and we'll, we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels and these dates and times. Tell a friend. I'm back here. I'm just very much involved. Bill's got here. He's brought over. He's brought some material here. We're going to really get some discussion. You know, I guess let me start off by saying this guy's got to get back in school. I mean, those kids are waiting for you. They really miss you, Bill. They really do. They really miss you, Bill. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to be pressing this thing all over the place. And now I'm really excited because uh, because now we've got other folks who are very interested in right. in you getting back in that classroom. Very, very important. And uh, and then actually there are the community folks that that had that didn't have the right answers. You know, we, we didn't know what was going on when you were relieved, if you will, of your job in right. Portland Public Schools. You got me. Mm -hmm. But now it's open up. It's really open up we, at the advent as as a result of this whole issue of Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. and selling bat body parts. I mean, that's just right. just throw it right out. Just body parts. 
And uh, now we got an election going on right now. We got a presidential election aspect of it. And excuse the French, thank God for that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they may have their own interests, but the fact of the matter is they're putting this issue on the table. And um, and now all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're finding out that these, they, they, the government is providing them at least five billion, five, 500 million, a half a billion dollars supporting Planned Parenthood and this whole issue with body parts and whatever. So they're saying, hey, look, let's defund these people. A lot of us didn't even know the, the amount of monies that were being spent right. in, in the government aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we got the whole issue with the crime deal. We got police. We got, and then we got other issues about, uh, well, people are talking about um, the whole issue of immigration. And, mm -hmm. and then more specifically, one of the ones in that I tend to identify with are uh, the Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you've got the incarceration issue and things of that nature. And so that's a, that's an area that I'm very very concerned about, and as far as you know, everybody's got their own little niche, if you will, and whatever. But um, but as far as the black community is concerned, I didn't say African American community. I said black community. There's a difference okay. between the two. But the fact of the matter is, they've got some major issue there. And uh, I, as you know, you and I, when we talked about mm -hmm. when we talked about this thing before you were relieved in mm -hmm. that whole process. We talked about the Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard deal, yeah. the demonstrations that you were having trying to educate the public and the lack of African-American black folks actually mm -hmm. being a part of that, uh, that movement. But now we know, and we knew about the whole issue about the Portland Development Commission of Portland that owned that property and sold some of that property to another black American. And then that person would basically sold that property to Planned Parenthood. And we have that, that situation right here on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Even gave them an opportunity, remember that? Yes. To say, look, why don't you move it uh, maybe east or west, but don't put it on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, right? Yes. Dr. King's the daughter came here in the whole nine yards. So I want to thank you very much for still staying here. But the fact of the matter is, you got to get back in that classroom. I'm sorry for that long introduction aspect of it, but it's important, okay? All right. All right? And we're going to stay with you, and we're going to stick, stay with you on this issue because it's a very important issue. It's a national issue now, and thank goodness for Caleb and folks like that of this particular group. Mm -hmm. as, as far as Melody is concerned, we're going to be working with them, and this is, this is just a start. So we're going to get them to come in here. You're going to say a few more words, kind of give us an update on where we are from our last, since you were here, and then we're going to bring Melody in. And then we're going to have Melody and then kind of give us an idea, a little update on what's going down. Because, as you know, we got a presidential debate. That will be, there's another opportunity. Hopefully, they will talk about this issue. And there's a question that will be asked of these candidates about this issue and get it out of the political realm. Because it's not about Republicans or Democrats. It's about this issue right here. Okay? All right? Okay? So with that, why don't we do it? Melody, welcome aboard. Absolutely, thank okay, you. Okay, good enough. Let's do a little brief real quick about uh, your organization, and then I'm going to get right back to Bill. Bill, you and I are going to be asking you a question. Okay. <laughs> good on, Melody. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I am a pro-life student, helped start a pro-life club at my college campus. Mm -hmm. And so um, this last Tuesday, we held our Women Be Trade rally. Um, and so that was a rally. Um, we had over 300 people attend. Um, we were outside the Beaverton Planned Parenthood. Wow. And we called for the official investigation of Planned Parenthood and also for Planned Parenthood to be defunded. Um, in light of the new Center for Medical Progress undercover videos, um, we believe that um, that they reveal illegal activity of the sale of baby body parts and also Planned Parenthood making an actual profit off of those. Um, and obviously this is a, a national issue. This is not Republican or Democrat right, or religious exactly. issue. This exactly. is an illegal exactly. practice and it's frankly horrifying and um, it definitely um, does not uphold the dignity of human life. I see, I see. And I, I got to ask you a question right up front with you. Yeah. I, I, the bill knew we talked about the same thing. Did you see people like, like me, of my color, in, the, in those rallies? You know, I didn't get to see the audience very well. Um, I know that we had um, Republicans um, there. We had a Democrat speak, and we had people from Democrats for Life. I didn't get to survey the audience black folks. very well. I'm just being right up front with you. Right. I didn't get to... <laughs> survey the audience right. very well. Well, that's another reason. I wish you had a, all due respect, <laughs> I wish you had a rally right on MLK, right, Bill? Because mm -hmm. I called Bill about that the first time around, and that's how, you know, we got you here. We want to thank you very much for being. I realize people are thinking about, you know, sure, it's it's about all folks, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Everybody matters, but my point is that I've been wanting to focus on, focus on black folks because it, because it, as I as I picked up my smartphone, I looked at Planned Parenthood, and there were certain stats 
about where they were building these facilities, okay? Yeah. You can talk about a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. 78% um, of Planned Parenthood centers are located within walking distance of black or Latino communities. Um, obviously, they're, maybe it's not so obvious for some people, but they're founded on a eugenist and racist principles. Margaret Sanger um, has been quoted um, was saying all kinds of things about how she wishes um, black America and Americans were gone. Um, and obviously that's, it's completely outrageous. Um, mm -hmm. And and still they, um, because their centers are located so close to these minority communities, um, some people have to be suspicious. What's really going on here? Well, you know, and I'm gonna get Bill in here right now because uh, when you think about it, when you say black and Hispanic, let me let me give you a little feel. I'm a Catholic. I was, I was I was born a Catholic aspect of it, and majority of the Latino communities are Catholics. Right. They are totally anti-abortion in many ways. So the so you got the the bulk of the the, the whole effort are the black communities. You got me. Uh, I, I would say that they would resist building having uh, those facilities built in. The Latino communities. You, are you getting my drift aspect of it? I do. Um, they're still not to say, but but they're still part of the process. My point is that their focus right now is on the immigration issue. See what I'm saying? And I'm I'm more I'm more interested in the the, the history that Bill brought to the table initially. Not to say that hey, I want to say this lightly about any of the, the other issues, but I want to make sure that we we bring those on. We'll yeah, keep this thing going. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Let's build. Bill, let's bring Bill in at this point in time. Bill, what's our update today? Um, well, I'm not sure all of what you want to know. I think, uh, you know, Melanie brought up some of the, about the history of Planned Parenthood. It started mm -hmm. in 1916 by Margaret Singer, so it's almost 100 years old. It was called the American Birth Control League. Mm -hmm. And she started it for, um, for two reasons, really. One was for the free sex, and that's why they always work so hard to get, um, you know, a lot of promiscuity down mm -hmm. to the lower levels or trying to get a high school and grade schools, middle schools. Mm -hmm. um, she, she had many extramarital affairs, so she certainly practiced what she preached, whether people like that or not. Mm. Um, and her biographies do, do uh, state that. I mean, she ne never made any, um, she never tried to hide that at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's number one is um, for all the people who have, who have been hurt um, in society, especially you know, in the last 50 years, you know, by by sex outside of marriage and and um, all, all all the sundry that's going on. We you know, there's many many reports of porn and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. So things have really gotten out of hand with that. But um, you know, Planned Parenthood's there, and they still follow the the vision of their follower to try to you know, instill that sex with anyone at any time is fine. Mm -hmm. um, Planned Parenthood had a, uh, a website called, um, you know, teenwire.com, and they had um, different, different things on it, such as, um, you know, I want to have um, um, cyber sex with my boyfriend. Um, uh, I was reading some information about wanting to know what sex play is. Um, what does dry humping mean? Mm. Um, just, just on and on. Um, they had things about how to make anal sex more comfortable mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. for women and things of that sort. Um, in, in regards to the eugenics part, um, unfortunately that, that's so true. Uh, when they were going to build the center in, um, up here on Martin Luther King Boulevard, just about a mile from here, even less than a mile right. from here. Um, quite a few people came from the neighborhood to, to speak against that. One of them was uh, W.G. Hardy from... Uh, yeah, Pastor Hardy. Uh, Pastor Hardy yes. from his church out on uh, 76 there in Gleason. Right. And um, he mentioned, you know, who would be the ones getting abortions. And he tried to explain that to the commissioners. And sure enough, you know, at the beginning of the next year, Planned Parenthood through the Gutmacher um, Institute put out this report that said black women are five are almost 500 percent uh, more likely to have an abortion than a than a white woman and Hispanic women are almost 300 percent more likely to to have an abortion um, than uh, than white women. 
one of the things plan this also report also said uh, this is off the the race issue, but Planned Parenthood always says, well, you know, if we give people contraceptives, then yeah. we wouldn't have to be doing abortions. And uh, Planned Parenthood, this was their own report that said 54 percent of women who have had abortions have been using contraceptive methods within that month. Hmm. And in fact, 80 percent of of the people getting abortions have been using, you know, contraceptives. Mm -hmm. And again, over 54% of them were using that month. Now, quite a few people who do get pregnant on contraceptives don't choose to have an abortion. So that really shows that the contraceptives, um, you know, just giving those out, mm -hmm. they don't work. They don't work amongst ma married people, much less teenagers who mm -hmm. have a hard time, you know, bringing a pencil to class every day. Well, let me make a point here, Bill, right now. I know for a fact when we had our our gathering, you and I, you know, back when, before you were laid off for Portland Public Schools. I wasn't laid off. You I was know, fired. You were fired. He was yeah. fired. Like, I'm I, trying they, to be they, nice. They, I'm trying to be modest. They, they walked me out with the police they just walked to make you a out with wow. Well, that's why I want to get back. My yeah. point is that mm -hmm. Bill shared all of this yeah. beforehand, okay? And here we are today, you know, we're going back over. Now I want to get right back down to, let, let's get down to the classroom thing and how, how you got involved in this piece with the schools, the school system, and all of a sudden you've got this, 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 uh, the, the, these folks walking in your classroom, mm -hmm. and saying they'd been sent by Portland Public Schools, right? You, but you had to allow them to uh, speak to this issue, right? That's right. Share that well, with them. Share it with the public. Mm -hmm. Well, a quick history of it. So, in in 2007, I was on various email lists, just like other people are, right. and uh, Immaculate Heart Catholic Church, which mm -hmm. is just. Uh, Le less than a half a mile from the Planned Parenthood, um, found out about that uh, Portland Development Commission was trying to just slide mm -hmm. that in, uh, turn out the Northeast Coalition neighborhoods. There was someone who worked there who went to That's Immaculate right. Heart, and they found out about it. So right off, uh, the deacon there sent out email, and then I found out about it. So I went to a, a meeting on February 29th of 2007, and... Um, uh, there was various community leaders there and, and people from the churches uh, in the area who did not want the Planned Parenthood there. Mm -hmm. um, and then fast forwarding a little bit, then, then we found out that Portland Development Commission was going to have some hearings. They had one in, Ap uh, one in March and one in April. And right before the one in April, someone called school to kind of cause trouble. Um, and asked asked for me, and um, then the principal actually took my took the message and called that number back, which I was surprised. I've you never heard anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then from that part, um, um, uh, the uh, one principal after another just uh, tried to hassle me. And in 2008 and 2009, the issue was there. They really didn't like me doing that in the community. Um, they told me that I couldn't say I was a teacher. Uh, which of course they had no right to say that, and I had to bring in a, an attorney. In fact, it was James yeah. Larenberger who's yeah. been here, yeah, Jim, and yeah. you know, and he pointed out to the school. He says, you know, you do not grant the teacher's license. That's mm -hmm. not up to you to say, say that. And then finally, the school said, well, um, you know, don't give the impression that that you're speaking for the school. Mm -hmm. Which I think most people, if they know much about Portland Public School, unfortunately, knows that they're very much. Um, very much like Planned Parent. I can't say it in a, in a different way. So then they start to go after me for uh, things within the school. And in 2009, I received an evaluation that was quite different than, than the one I had two years prior to that. And the union fought that pretty hard, and that was finally, you know, uh, expunged right. from the right. record. Right. And so then that principal left, and another one came in, and that's when the Planned Parent came in. And... Um, and another lawyer actually asked if I could get excused for get a religious accommodation, and they denied it. They said I had to um, to stay there for them. Wow. And then after that, they start to really look look for a lot of different things, and then finally on March 19th, the two. So, so where are we now with you? Are you in, are you in court? You... Um, well, back in September of 2014, a lawsuit was filed on my behalf. Okay. And. Um, uh, right now, that's in the discovery mode, where uh, different sides are asking for documents, and there's also been uh, depositions, mm -hmm. um, you know, by Portland Public Schools, um, mm -hmm. and um, there was also a lot of work 
really for the last eight years by the union and then the last few years by their attorneys too mm -hmm. in, in helping um, trying to cl clear all this up so the issue is back on the table right at this point it, in time. well it's still like it's yeah, still right, it's, right, it's right, never right, really right. been off the table it's been on good good it's on the table I'm, i know that there are probably some things that you can't discuss about the issue at no, this point in time no. but, well, once it gets but, to court i guess okay you know, good and if it does get to court then anyone well can good but well, hopefully you get your attorney to come on and you guys can come back on and mm -hmm. keep us up there because the yeah. public wants to know what's going on yes. and that's a very important piece mm -hmm. so now i want to bring melody back on and kind of get sure. a sense of what well, melody i'm sure you got some background now with your bill and right? you know you're familiar with his, his, his issue right across the board are you guys pretty well familiar with his issue i am familiar been uh bill spoke at our rally on tuesday oh, okay. about how um he was fired for not letting planned parenthood into his classroom okay. Okay. so i do know that much um it doesn't surprise me at all planned parenthood advocates all sorts of anti-parental notification mm -hmm. laws. Um, they've been caught um, covering up rape and not um, being a mandatory reporter. Mm -hmm. um, they've been caught in all kinds of illegal activity. Mm -hmm. And it, it is beyond time for the, the American public to look at Bill's case, to look at the illegal activity that Planned Parenthood has been caught on tape um, committing and, and just say, this is completely unacceptable for mm -hmm. our 500 million um, taxpayer dollars every year to right. go towards. Right. Um, if Planned Parenthood um, wants to survive, it can fundraise its own money like any other business. Mm -hmm. um, there are over 8,000 community health centers that people can go to that don't provide abortions, um, that that people can go to for help. People are not lost without Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. and we don't, we don't need them. Okay, do 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 us a favor too, because a lot of times folks don't actually have TV. They don't do they don't buy Comcast things of that nature. Sometimes people don't even read the the, the Oregonian today, the, the newspaper and aspect of it. Would you share with the public in this very simple form, not what simple form, but but the whole issue of selling body parts? Talk a little bit about that, that video and stuff. With it. Absolutely. So the Center for Medical Progress um, released three, I think three or four undercover videos now. Um, and in the first one, we see um, their top official, Dr. Deborah Nukatola, mm -hmm. talking about um, haggling over prices for aborted baby parts. Um, she talks about um, possibly changing the abortion procedure in order to get more intact body parts um, to be able to make more of a profit. She's um, quoted as saying, we want to be able to break even with the sell of these, but if we can do better than break wow. even. And there were visuals too. There was some visuals there. Absolutely, absolutely. In the, in the latest video that was released, um, we see, we actually have a visual of an ab aborted baby mm -hmm. and they're, they're haggling over whether this is um, intact enough and how much they're going to charge. Um, in the second video, um, another doctor that works for Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. um, haggling over prices, $75, no, I'm thinking higher, um, just haggling over the real cash value of baby's body parts. Mm. Um, she's quoted as saying, I want a Lamborghini. Wow. So wow. these Planned Parenthood officials are making money off of aborted baby parts. But I understand that there are more there are more videos, but I understand there's a gag order now. That government is significantly important. There right? is. The state, what's the deal? There was some sort of court case court about... Court case, I'm sure, yeah. Yes, about um, how they couldn't release videos containing certain parts of information. Right, right. Um, but my understanding is they're still planning to release they the next do, eight videos. Planning, okay, so you're going to stick with us, right? Absolutely. And you're going to stay with us right here and give us the update? I mean, Absolutely. It's a very it really is a very serious Very thing. serious. So what, what's your next move? What, what's your next thing? What, what are some of the things that you're getting Absolutely. Ready to do? So we have another rally coming up. Okay. Um, following the release of more undercover videos. Okay. Um, and and so we, we also want people to think of the aborted baby in the mm -hmm. video as a real human being with dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we see people wanting to call him Emmett. We want to give him a name. Um, he's a human um, and he deserved dignity. He didn't deserve to die like that. Um, and so we kind of are drawing the parallel between his body and Emmett Till's Emmett Till, being yes. shown his that. open yeah. casket funeral. I don't mm -hmm. know if everybody's commun uh, mm -hmm. familiar with that, yes. but um, a hate crime, a racist crime against Emmett Till and um, had an open casket funeral. We got to see his body um, mangled and it really sparked the civil rights movement mm -hmm. the same way that I see his um, another boy mm -hmm. um, 
right. his body shown yeah. in the videos. Well, now, how do we contact you to get involved, if you will, with the organization? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. every citizen can go to www.womenbetrayed.com. Okay. And there's an act. Spell, spell that out very slowly for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's um, www.womenbetrayed.com. Okay. And so there's an activism kit you can download there. There's talking points. We'd like you to go visit your legislators. Um, and there's also um, a media kit. We'd like you to send letters to the editors. And we're also planning on holding another rally. Um, so you can definitely um, keep keep up on when that date is going to be um, on womenbetrayed.com. Okay, well do, do us a favor, and I can maybe do this in the next week or whatever. Get me a flyer of some sort with that information, how to get to it. As Absolutely. Better. With a phone number, got me? Yeah. Because many of those folks out there, really, they're, they're not as tech uh, up or whatever. <laughs> and you young folks are right there, and I really appreciate the fact that the youth, the, you're the future. You're yeah. the future. It's very, very important that, that, uh, that you're involved in the process. Mm -hmm because uh, pe people like Bill and I, you know, we, we're here and, and we're gonna do everything we can, but it's very important that we support you in terms of what you're doing, because what, it, this is very horrific. It's a very serious situation. And I know how Bill, how sincere he was. And I'm pulling out my old files of those interviews that we've done, and I'm gonna be playing those over, Bill. Okay, very much in part. And if you've got any material, or whether it be um, uh, either, uh, maybe it was something on the rally, uh, some of the spokespeople. I understand you might have had some presidential candidates there. Ben Carson. In the uh, D.C. rally? Yeah, mm -hmm. the D.C. area. He spoke. And ben, if he spoke about this issue, if you can get us something, I'll be more than glad to, to attach that to my next show. Great. And things of that nature, because we're going we're gonna to really stay on this issue. Let me ask okay. Bill another point, too. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we talked about that a little bit from a local standpoint. The local newspapers uh, carry uh, uh, the, 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 the news uh, as far as your issues, like, well, like the Observer newspaper they, they did, or the Scanner newspaper uh, or the El Hispanic newspaper. Oh, well, that I'm not sure of those local ones. No, I'm not sure of that. Okay, but no one, no one interviewed you. Um, well, actually, a couple did ask for interviews, but no, but for the observer, uh, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking about well, the, the black observer, newspaper. The, ver the observer and the scanner did not. Well, I'm at week, which is a smaller newspaper, asked they when, contacted when, you when they you know walked me out in 2013. They did, but I by that time I was so, just needed kind of a break break from yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you have a problem if they interviewed you now? No, they could, the Observer okay, so, could interview. So the invitation is here. Uh, the yes. Portland Observer newspaper, mm -hmm. the Black newspaper, the, the Scanner newspaper, the Hispanic newspaper, that's okay, too, yeah. right? What about the Asian reporter, the that's, Asian newspaper? That's fine, too. These are all considered, if you will, part of the group, and yeah. it, it should be a major concern. So, yeah. again, uh, uh, Bill is inviting you to, because the people within those various communities mm -hmm. need to know what's going on. Right. Very, very important. And those are mediums that they tend to identify with mm -hmm. because they identify with their respective groups. Mm -hmm. Very important. And in fact, what about yourself? Did, did anybody contact you all about, like the Portland Observer newspaper, the Scanner, <laughs> and all those folks? Have they contacted you? Um, we do have an article in the Oregonian about our Women Betrayed rally. Um, K2 interviewed us. Most of the media was at the rally. Okay. So we have some interviews. What's the possibility of taking those same, those same, that same information that you sent to those mediums, and just uh, send it to the Observer? The Scanner newspaper, the El Hispanic, the Asian reporter, okay? You okay. See, you get my drift? We did. We tried to get press releases, information out to all the media outlets in our area, so but I'm not sure it. if we covered them. Okay, so. but just in case, yeah. if it's possible. Because I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they're out there because those respective groups tend to identify with that with those entities, okay? Absolutely. That's a very important. And they need to be a part and parcel of what's going on. Because the concern I have is the is the idea of trying to make this a political kind of a thing. That's R is against the D's. It is not. It's, Human it's a, rights it's, issue. It's a very simple situation. Okay, good. All right. All right, Dave. Thank you very much, buddy. Well, look, thank you all very much. We'll get back again. Appreciate it very much. Okay. Thanks thank for the information. You. All right. Have a good one. Take care.